Hello and welcome to this afternoon's debate. Um, my name is Rosie Boycott. I'm a journalist um, and I think of relevance to today I'm also uh, a recovering alcoholic and I belong to a 12-step program and have done for quite a long time. So I have lots of uh, enthusiasm about events like today because uh, quite frankly you wouldn't wish a drink problem on your worst enemy and it's horrible to see lots of especially seeing lots of young people uh, getting into incredible trouble with alcohol so i'm really really interested in the outcomes of this i've been told this is a light-hearted debate but actually i think that the answers are fantastically important as to <coughs> what can the harm from al how can we reduce the harm from alcohol in this country what ideas can we have i mean we'd all love a bullet the silver bullet that would just solve it. Uh, I don't believe there is one, but it will take the combined efforts of everybody and lots of great thinking. So the idea of this debate um, is you've got to imagine me and my fellow panelists on this table are all in a hot air balloon somewhere over London, I know it's hard, and that they, all four of them, have five minutes initially and then another two to present you with their idea uh, in answer to this question. You are then going to get a chance to vote on it. The two that you like the least will then be chucked out. Um, so bear that in mind when you reject their plans. Uh, we're then left with two in the rapidly sinking balloon, and you're going to then vote on one of them. There'll be different stages of them arguing a little bit among themselves and producing their thoughts. Uh, I don't think you get much input into this apart from voting. So. How it's going to be is that each of our speakers has got five minutes to start with, and we're going to run through it, straight through, to present their answer to the question of how we can reduce the harm from alcohol. And I'm going to start with asking Ian Gilmore to come up to the platform there. I think he probably needs very little introduction to everyone here. He's trustee of Alcohol Research UK, and he's the chair of the Alcohol Health Alliance, as well as being a consultant physician. So. I have got a stopwatch, all right? So this is about being fair, assuming things work well here, and I'm just about to turn it on now. Ian, off you go. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over the burden of, of alcohol on health harm in the UK, uh, but if any of the other speakers tell you that uh, reducing the nation's consumption will cause our cardiac wards to be stuffed full of people dying prematurely of coronary heart disease, then I will come back on the evidence. Now, I'm a little anxious because I have been known in the past to be just a tad critical of some of government's uh, policies uh, over uh, reducing the health harm from alcohol, and I've heard an unsubstantiated rumour that the Secretary of State for Health has packed the audience with stooges who will be voting me out. <laughs> so I'd like the remainder of you to take pity on me. Uh, he has indeed, I think, somewhat unfairly parodied me as a, as a one-string-to-my-bow person who talks about nothing, about nothing but minimum unit price. Uh, but that's not true, and we do need a range of policies to reduce health harm. I, perhaps, on the other hand, have slightly parodied the government's stance as being unidimensional and all about voluntary partnerships with the drinks industry. Let's be clear, I have nothing against the drinks industry. Some of my best friends are in the drinks industry. Well, that's not actually true, but uh, I did. <laughs> uh, my, best, my best school friend ended up as chief executive of the Tobacco Advisory Council, and I had to put on a false beard when I went out for a drink with him. But anyway, uh, I don't blame the drinks industry. I do blame governments for seeking to involve the drinks industry in setting public health strategy to tackle the problem. Yes, let industry... Uh, sort out its own house in matters such as serving underage drinkers and the like, but no, don't let the industry tell us uh, that, that to pursue policies such as education and information uh, that they love and we know don't work. Don't let the drinks industry uh, um, tell us that our problems have nothing to do with cheap booze available 24-7, but all we need is a little bit of a change of culture. Now, I would be betraying the principles of the Alcohol Research UK and AERC if I did anything other than give you an evidence-based approach. And we have three decades of evidence of what works in reducing health harm. And you know those well, the three arms of price, availability, and marketing. 
and price is the primum inter pares, that's the first among equals, where the evidence is strongest, the impact of modulating price, usually through tax, on consumption and harm. Now, minimum unit price is a more subtle uh, intervention, which has not been subject to so much evidence. Um, it's a less blunt instrument than just shoving up the tax, and it's nuanced to target cheap, discounted drink and uh, to target heavier drinkers. And we all await with bated breath to see what will happen north of the border. And it's absolutely crucial that any change north of the border is carefully monitored in a natural experiment. But it's likely that England will be uh, dragged kicking and screaming rather like it was with smoking in public places by initiatives in other parts of the UK on bringing in a minimum unit price. I believe we should be optimistic. Five years ago, no single political party accepted that price was important. Uh, now they all accept it, and the discussion is about how it sh change should be brought about. Um, the last two Secretary of States for Health have both said, since leaving office, that they wish they'd looked much harder at minimum unit price. But it's easy to be bold when you're no longer in office. And we know from the research we've heard, together with the launch of Alcohol Research UK, that uh, there is some work to do with the general public. Uh, it's important that we really help them understand that they're not just being turkeys voting for Christmas. Finally, I'm a clinician first and a quasi-public health doctor second, so I want to concentrate on the individual as well as the population. And we have to consider individuals, and it's our, it's our responsibility to be strong advocates for our patients, because we know that interventions for individual patients <coughs> work right across the spectrum, whether it's the person who's just beginning to drink a bit more than they should and having a brief intervention versus the hard end of the spectrum, if you like, alcohol treatment services for the severely dependent. They work and they're cost effective and people out there do not believe they work. And we need to be really strong advocates with our politicians, with our local governments, with our, with our, our hospital managers to get these services funded because they are good value for money. So. Look at the population, use the three arms of, that we all know so well actually work, but also don't forget the individual. I rest my case. Very good. Ten minutes under time. So the next speaker is Malcolm Law, who's the Professor of Epidemiology, sorry about that, and Preventative Medicine at the Wolfson Institute. You have, uh, hold on, you have five minutes. Thank you. I was um, amused to read the blurb on me where I was described as having some interesting ideas about alcohol because that's such a terribly polite way of saying um, not to believe a word of what I say because I don't believe that it's going to be helpful to increase the price. What I do believe very strongly is that measures and changes work if you involve the community and you get the backing of the entire community and that's my take on this. I was involved, um, not in alcohol, but I was involved in the work on passive smoking that contributed to the ban in public places. And I have to say, which was several years ago now, I have to say that even though I thought it was very much the right thing to do, it hadn't a hope of working, because how on earth was it going to be reinforced? Who's going to come to, into a pub and stop someone from lighting up a cigarette? But it did work, it was extremely successful, and I saw the reason it worked on my journey to work because I travel in on the Hammersmith and City line which goes through some of the rougher areas of London and you'd see a young man get onto the tube exuding surliness and aggression and he'd light up a fag and a little old lady would tap him on the shoulder and say excuse me but it's banned and you're not allowed to smoke in carriages anymore now, if I'd done that, I'd be lucky to escape with verbal rather than physical abuse. But what made brought it off the little old lady wasn't just that he had some scruples, but that after she said that everyone in the carriage would look up and everyone, every single person's body language and nodding and everything would convey to the young man that they all agreed with her, that none of the, no one in the whole carriage wanted him to smoke. And so he got off and put out his cigarette. That impressed me because when Boris Johnson banned, smoke, banned drinking on the tube, I, that, I thought that was the right thing to do because on the Hammerson City Line people commonly drank beer out of cans and you could sense that it made the other passengers feel uncomfortable 
and frightened. I didn't think that had a chance of working, but it's been equally successful. And I, th I never see a soul drinking or a person drinking on the Hammersmith and City Line now. And I think it's for the same reasons, because it had the backing of um, the entire community and bands work when ordinary people reinforce them. So if we come to a pub, I might suggest that the government bring in some regulation where a publican refuses to serve alcohol who someone who, to someone who's drunk. We might go further and that the publican actually has to leave people who are visibly drunk, have to ask them to leave the pub. We might say it hasn't a hope of working, but we said that when they introduced the smoking ban. And I think it would work for the same reason as the smoking ban worked in pubs, that the majority of people wanted it. And indeed, even the majority of smokers wanted that ban. And I think similarly, the great majority of drinkers would want a ban on drunk people in pubs. And I think that could extend to drinking in public places more generally. Now, the smoking ban in public places was important because it changed the image of smoking. Smoking used to be sophisticated. Now, smokers are sad and even rather dirty people, and you see them huddled outside the door, standing in the rain, drawing on their fags. And that's had an important effect because the proportion of Act people of adults who actively smoke, who smoke 20 cigarettes a day, it was very high. It came down to 30% with all the health education and what have you, and it stuck there. It was stuck in a rut and it was there for years and nobody thought that we'd ever get um, people less than 30% of the population smoking. Over just uh, quite rapidly, it came right down to 20%. That's a reduction of a third, which is a very big reduction. And the reason that it, that happened was the change in image of smoking. It followed on from the ban of smoking in public places. So I'd like to suggest that if drunkenness can be banned in public places, that is going to reinforce um, the same change in image. There was a further measure in relation to smoking which greatly alleviated the harm it did that's insufficiently appreciated and that is that the tar yield of cigarettes came down. They came down enormously by over half in over a couple of decades. Similarly with um, the obesity epidemic, the um, the aim is to reduce portion size to make chocolate bars smaller. Now the government have reinforced the first but not the second. I would like to see the um, alcohol content of wine, which has increased from 9% to 14% come down, and I'd like to see the size of wine glasses get made smaller. All of that could be brought about by simple regulations and guidelines issued by government, um, reinforced by the great mass of the community, the population. Okay. Thank you.